If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We've been looking at how not to live an eternal life. That is, by living according to our sinful bodily desires. Uh, but now, in chapter 8, we're going to see how do you do it. We're going to start, and Lord willing, we're going to be putting in uh, three sessions, three Sunday mornings, uh, three Sunday school hours, if you're involved in Sunday school, seeing about how you go about living the Christian life. Now, I want to walk you through chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> I want to explain Paul's argument, and I want to point out four things, uh, four keys to living the Christian life, things that will help us to live an eternal life. We recognize we can't do it in ourselves. We're going to have to, number one, reject we're going to have to reject fleshly living in favor of a spiritual life, or life that's based on the spirit and not the flesh. It's not a matter of what I do. It's a matter of following his leading, as we've been singing about. Then I've got to refocus, verses 5 through 8. We're going to see about refocusing my mind from fleshly thinking to the spirit's desires. Not what I want, but what does the spirit want? And then number three, we're going to see in verses 9 through 11 that we need to recognize who does this. We've got to recognize who does this, and I'll explain that as we get closer. And then finally, we've got to reorient to our inheritance and live as an adopted child of God. I saw a preacher this week, I was telling some of the guys about it, and uh, listening to a thing on YouTube or one of those things, and I would listen to this fellow, and he said, I'm not going to preach as long as I usually preach. I'm going to preach longer. Well, I don't know whether you're going to preach longer, but if we don't get to point number four, Lord willing, we'll take up next Sunday. If the Lord comes back, we'll review this as history. You know, but we'll be all right. But we'll try to get all the way down because point number four about reorienting ourselves to our inheritance is the lead into the next section. And it's very important, and I want to spend as much time as necessary in that regard. I want you to notice in chapter 8 that uh, it is continuing the thought of uh, chapter 7, verse 6. Notice it says there, We have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. He is picking up that theme having dealt with two objections, the two questions we looked about in Sunday school this morning, is the problem with the law. Is the law sin? No, the law is not the problem. The problem is we're trying to follow a set of rules. And there's nothing at all wrong with the set of rules. The Ten Commandments, as we looked at them last week, there's not really anything wrong with the rules. Is the law sinful? No. The law is not sinful. The law points out what is right and holy and just and good. This is what we ought to be. The problem resides within us. Inside of us is a sinful nature that desires the things of this world, the things of the flesh, that seeks out what I want instead of what God wants. It's been that way ever since the garden. Ever since sin entered into the world, and Adam and Eve decided that they wanted things on their timetable instead of on God's timetable. They wanted things the way they wanted them. They wanted to arise and be like God and know good and evil. And since that point, we've been struggling with sin within. The problem is not the rule. Look at these rules. Look at these rules. Can there be anything wrong with these rules? Wouldn't you like to live in a society where people honor their father and mother? How many of you would like to live in a, in, a, in a place where you didn't know when you walked out your door to get the paper you were going to be murdered or not? Anybody want to volunteer for that? Let, let me go to such and such place. Let me go to a place, used to, be the, <clears throat> used to be the joke before Katrina about New Orleans. Somebody said, cover me, I'm going to get the paper. It was about bad. It's getting close to that now. We don't want to live in that kind of society. We don't live in a society where there's adultery. We don't want to live in a society where people steal. We don't want to be in a society where people are bearing false witness about one another. Most of the trouble in the world comes from mouthing. You know why we mouth? You know why we steal? Why we commit adultery? Why we murder people? Why we don't honor father and mother? I think it's that last one. It says, do not covet. 
We want something other than what God wants. We want something other than what's good for other people. We want what we think is going to make us happy. The problem is not the rules. The rules are good. The Ten Commandments are a good law. The problem is we can't keep them. We need to understand that. As Christians, we've got an additional problem. We're a little bit like the character in uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's book, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, we're two people now. We've got this within us, this principle of evil, this sin, that at any moment would love to take over and lead us into coveting, lead us into things which are horrible and sinful, put not only thoughts in our head, but actions to our feet. And yet, as Christians, we now also want to serve God's righteous law. We want to do what's right. We want to please God. And so we're a Jekyll and a Hyde. And that sounds like a really horrible place to be. You know, you're the type of person, you're, you're two people. And that sounds very difficult, very horrible, until we remember that before Christ came, before we put our trust in Him and the Holy Spirit of God came to live within us, we were Mr. Hyde alone. The only principle of life we cared about was us. The only way we could deal with life was to deal with it in a sinful fashion. When somebody said don't covet, we thought about all kinds of ways of coveting and we did most of them. We were living that way. That was before salvation. Listen, when evil, when sin has a hold of your life, it will ruin and run your life. But now... Since the coming of the Spirit, there's a Dr. Jekyll living inside of us, wanting to do right, wanting the things of the law. And as Paul says at the end of verse uh, uh, 25 of chapter 7, So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. I'm glad the book doesn't end there. I'm thrilled that chapter 8, verse 1 follows chapter 7, verse 25. Notice what he says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful change has taken place in us. We moved from someone on death row, someone condemned to die, condemned to be separated from God for all eternity. Not just to have a miserable life now, but to be separated from the God who is life for all eternity. Not condemned. Not condemned. There'll never be a time when the child of God will stand at the judgment and hear their sins brought up and have Christ the judge say to them, you must die for your sins. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those are great words. We who once were handcuffed, condemned to death, are now set free. God has provided the key because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What a wonderful truth in the word of God. Notice what it says in verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Now what's he saying there? Well, he's not saying that Jesus Christ came to earth as a sinful human being. But he did come to earth as a human being. Do you realize that God who forever from all eternity, was the perfect Son of God, chose deliberately to take upon Himself human flesh, to become a man, to partake of the same nature, the same body, the same spirit and soul structure that we have, to fully become a human being forevermore, to limit Himself down to an earthly life for a period of time in order that he might die in our place, 
Because that's the only remedy, the only way to deal with our sin, the only way to show us the magnificence of God, to show us His grace. He had to come and take upon human flesh, human body, human soul, in order that He might die there on the cross in our place, offering Himself, as it says here, as a sin offering, the payment for our sin. And I asked... Do you think he did that so that we could live a sinful life? No. It says that in doing that, at the end of verse 3, it says, And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're not condemned, even though we're not righteous in practice yet. We're not righteous in our vertical relationship with God. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind? Yeah, that's what you were created to do. I think all of us could say, you know, there's many times today, and it's not even noon. It'll be noon soon. But it's not noon yet. And we still haven't focused on the Lord all of our love and all of our heart and all of our soul yet. We fall short. Under the law, we be condemned. But under grace, God says, I'm working on that. Depend on me. I will produce that in you. I'll develop that heart in you for me. So you fall so in, hopelessly in love with God, you can't stand the idea of not being with Him, not thinking about Him, not incorporating Him in every part of life. We fail vertically. We're not there yet. We're also failing in our horizontal relationship with other people. Leviticus 19.18 says this, Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God says if you love me, you ought to love other people. As I focus on God and His love, and as the Holy Spirit of God develops that love in me, it's going to flow out to other people. Remember that second table of the law, the six commandments? That flows out of the love of God. If I reject God and honoring Him and keeping His name holy and resting upon Him, then I'm going to violate the other six because they're dependent upon God giving me the ability to love other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's talking about not the righteous requirements. Did you notice what he said? Look at uh, verse 4. Start right at verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement, singular, of the law might fully be met in us. Not requirements, not all the details, but what the law intended to produce in you and me a righteous person. Right in relationship with God, righteous in relationship to how we treat other people. That's the summation, Jesus said, of the whole law and the prophets. So the first lesson in living a spiritual life, in living a life that we've been called to live, in becoming Christ-like, is we've got to reject fleshly living. We've got to turn away from that which is fleshly. Now, I need to define some terms that he's using here. Let's do that because there's some things that we need to understand how he's using He's going to use the term flesh and body, and we need to understand that. Understand, he's using two different words there. The word translated flesh and the word translated body, different words. Flesh is a noun that refers to the human nature dominated by sin, or in other words, the sin nature. When you see the word flesh here, when he's talking about the flesh, he's not talking about this. That's body. He's talking about the sin nature that dwells inside of my flesh. This is what God designed. Sin is is dwelling inside of what God designed. God did not make you a sinner. God did not create mankind as a sinner. We were created good. Evil has come in. And so when he talks about flesh, he's talking about that evil part of us, that alien part of us that's a part of who we are now. Uh, the Greek word is the word sark. Uh, sarkikos in this particular instance. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning about sarcasm. There's the word. Sarcasm. 
means to cut somebody to the flesh with your words. If you need any lessons, I'm a master. I can teach you how to be sarcastic, how to cut somebody with your words. That's sarcasm. It's the word sark. It's fleshly. The second word is the word for body. It's a noun, and it refers to the physical part of man. It's used in this passage when he says, he did this for our mortal bodies. You and I are in mortal bodies. Some of us are more mortal. No, we can't be more mortal than others. Some of us are closer to mortality than others. You know, you never know. You look around, you think somebody with a lot of white hair, you think, man, they're really close to dying, uh, a lot closer than me. But you know, death doesn't respect any age. You can be young and die. You can be old and die. But there's one thing for certain. We're all going to die. You have to recognize that fact. It's becoming clearer and clearer to me in regard to me. Every time I go to a funeral, every time I see somebody that, you know, hey, I just saw them and now they're not here anymore. You're thinking, wow, death is coming. That's the physical part. There's coming a time when the soul, the person I really am, the person God is making me into is going to be departing this body. And this body, there's, that's death. It's physical separation of the soul from the body. And you look there and, hey, the person is not there. There is that separation that's coming. God is going to rescue me in my mortal body. He's going to pull me out of this mortal body. And the Bible says he's going to give me an immortal body. So those two terms, as you're reading this passage, understand when he talks about flesh, he's not talking about your body. He's talking about your, your soul, your spiritual nature, uh, and op the opposite of your spiritual nature. When he's talking about body, he's talking about your actual body, your physical body. The next terms are the terms spirit and spirit. See the difference? Well, there really isn't any difference in Greek. In Greek, they just use the word spirit. Spirit means spirit. Now, fortunately, the translators try to help us in this in that they will capitalize when they think spirit is referring to the Holy Spirit, and it'll be lowercase when it's referring to just our human spirit. First one, spirit is the part of man that relates to God. That's the spirit. I think people are body, soul, and spirit. The Bible teaches me in Ephesians 2, 1, that the spiritual part of me is dead before I'm quickened to life by faith in Jesus Christ. The spirit of God quickens me, but that spiritual part relates to God. When I was unsaved, that part wasn't relating to God. It was just dead. It was dormant. It was just there. It wasn't doing anything I was a immaterial part, soul and spirit, but the spirit was dead. The soul was just breathing, trying to fumble through life, trying to figure out how do I relate to the God who gave me this life. But my spirit has been quickened, been livened up, been made alive by the Holy Spirit of God. That's the second part. And this passage, when you see the term spirit capitalized, and most of the time it will be because he's talking about either the Holy Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit of Christ, Christ's Spirit, God's Spirit, the Spirit of holiness. He's talking about the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, who from all eternity has been the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And he is the one who has been given to us to live inside of us. Now, here's the point. If you're going to live a spiritual life, You've got to refocus yourself on the Spirit's desires. Look what he says in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There is a fundamental shift in our focus when we come to know the Lord. We decide we're going to start living for the Lord. You shift from focusing on fleshly things to spiritual things, from things below to things above. There is nothing below that will be above. Let me say that again. There is nothing below that will be above. When you leave this body to walk into the very presence of Jesus Christ, you'll take nothing with you. Your body will even stay behind. 
We need to focus on spiritual things, and on particular, he says there, on what the Spirit desires. What does the Spirit of God want? Ought to be the watchword of our mind. Now, we've got a problem with that because we still have a fleshly sinful nature. Notice what he says in verse 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Which would you rather have, by the way? Death or life? All right. The mind governed by the flesh, in verse 7, is hostile to God. Wow, it's hostile to God. The fleshly mind, the mind that's focused on the things of the flesh, is hostile to God. That's true of the unsaved. It's true of the carnal. It's true of believers that have their focus simply on the things of sin, the things of coveting, the things of wanting the things of this world. Your mind is hostile to God. Don't want God. Don't want to accept God as He is. Every sinful person seeks to be their own God. If you don't believe that, get to hurting sometime. And see if you don't want the world to revolve around you. Whatever it takes to change so that I stop hurting, so I get out of this pain. Whatever it is, that's what I want. It has, pain has a way of focusing our attention on the fact that we want everything in our world to go as we would like for it to go. And pain doesn't fit that picture. Our mind, our fleshly mind is hostile to God. We don't want God to be in control. You're going to reject the sovereignty of God. You know why? Because you don't want it that way. There's going to be something in your mind, the fleshly part of your mind that says, no, I don't want Jesus Christ, I don't want God to be governing my life. I don't want Him to be sovereign over everything. There's just something naturally within us that rebels with that. It's that fleshly nature that is hostile to God. Look what he says. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It's the enemy of God. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God's law. It does not submit to God's law. It refuses to submit to God's way and instead seeks to establish his own way. Romans 14, 17, look what it says there. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Well, obviously the kingdom of God is not in southeast Louisiana, right? But of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The fleshly mind says eating good is what's really important. Having things, that's what's really important. That's more important than anything else. But the Spirit says it's all about being righteous, about right living is more important than right eating. Peace is more important than getting your way. And joy is a lot more important than happiness. In these three things, righteousness, peace, and joy, the mind is set on the flesh. It does not want what God wants. It rejects the right and seeks gratification instead. I'd rather do what's pleasing than what's right. It is rejects peace and instead wants control, not war. Nobody wants war. Nobody wants conflict. But in order to avoid conflict, we want control. We want to keep everything working. This way. We don't want peace. We want everybody doing what we want. If everybody does, I tell people around here, I don't care who's in charge as long as things go my way. Well, you know, that's not true, is it? If you want everything to go your way, that means you want to be in charge. You just don't want to be seen to be in charge. You want everything to work out. We reject peace because we want to control things. We want everybody to dress the way we want them to dress, to act the way they want us, we want them to act, to look the way we want them to look, to be perfectly related to us as we would like for them to relate to us. We want control rather than that which is truly peace with one another. The mindset on the flesh misuses things. It misses out on joy because it's pursuing happiness. The Spirit of God, the kingdom of God is all about joy. But we're busy pursuing happiness. We are talking about it in Sunday school this morning. I'm trying to remember the exact term, but the idea is that by being covetous, we are, I know the word, it's uncontented. We live a life of uncontentment. 
we can't enjoy God and the spiritual things, the things that last, because we got to get stuff. We got to get things. You ever been under the gun financially? Well, I was under the gun one time financially. I couldn't enjoy uh, a concert. Guy invited me to a free concert. I'm not talking about hillbilly concerts. I'm talking about, you know, dress up, hall. You know, we were sitting in the balcony, but I mean, it's a nice concert. I couldn't enjoy it because my mind was focused on this job I was trying to do and trying to get this done and just really worried about it, upset about things. Missed out totally on a great experience. You know, they, I know they were singing good down there. I didn't understand what they were saying, but they were singing nice. The music was good. But my mind was in turmoil. I was uncontented. I was discontented with where I am. I was pursuing happiness, what I thought would make me happiness. I was missing out on joy. I was missing out on happiness as it went by. Happiness, of course, is a temporary thing. It depends on the circumstance. If I can get all the circumstances right, if everything's right in my life, then I'll be happy. That's totally different from joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that God and God alone can produce in us. The fleshly mind, notice what he says, cannot submit to the things of God. He cannot submit to God's law. The mind governed by the flesh, verse 7 says, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You know why? Because to do so means to give up being the flesh. It gives up getting what I want and saying I want what God wants. That's more important. And the flesh cannot do that. Do you see why you can't live a spiritual life in the power, in your own power? The flesh will dominate you every time. It'll ruin you every single time. Well, the spiritual mind is set in harmony with the spirit. It focuses on what the spirit of God desires. You ask this question. What does the Holy Spirit of God want? Most of the time we ask, what do I want? What will please me? The question is, what does the Holy Spirit of God desire in this situation, in this decision, in this treatment of this person, in making these things? What is it that God wants? That's more important. It's more important when we decide things as a church that we figure out what God wants than we figure out what we want. Church doesn't exist to make us happy. Church exists to please God. You see, sometimes we get the misimpression about church that, uh, you know, you're the audience, I'm the actor. No, 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 no. I'm the prompter. When we worship God, God is the one who's the audience, and he is watching what we're doing. He's looking not only at the words we sing and whether we go high or low, or whether we sing the right word exactly and we get the timing right, what he's looking at He's not even looking at the smile on our face. He's looking at the expression in our heart. Are you worshiping him? Is your heart for God? That's spiritual life. I want what God wants, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. That's the only way we can live a spiritual life. It's not a right now decision. It's an every now decision. Every moment of your life, you've got to decide. You've got decisions you make. You've got to choose. What are you going to do with your time? How are you going to live your life? And the foremost, prime thing ought to be, what's going to please the Holy Spirit of God? What's He leading me to do? Let me do that. Let me walk that way. What does the Holy Spirit of God desire for you? He desires that you not die. That seems to me to be a good trait in a friend. It's an excellent trait in a physician. I really want that in a physician. I'm really looking for somebody that doesn't want me to die. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to die, not only physical, but also spiritual life. The other thing that we need to recognize, the Holy Spirit of God desires that you live. Sin, Satan, and his world, their sole desire is that you die. Die spiritually that you misspend your life, that you miss out on God's things for you, what God wants to do in your life. They want you to miss life now, and they sure would like for you to miss eternity with God. The Holy Spirit of God is focused on you having your best life now. I hate to borrow that stupid title, but that's the point. 
It's what God's Spirit wants for you is what really life is about. It's not about what you want. It's about what He wants. And He wants you to live. What did God want Adam and Eve to do in the garden? Live. Eat. Enjoy. Trim the trees. Take care of the garden. Stay away from that one because that one will kill you. You see, He doesn't want you to die. He wants you to live. God and God alone has your best interest at heart. God has your best interest. He wants you to live. He doesn't want you to go through life in misery. He wants you to live. But He knows what that means. He knows what it means for you to live. For you to fulfill the purpose for which He's called you. For you to, He knows exactly what's got to happen in your life for Romans 8.28 to work out. For you to become like His Son Jesus Christ. To develop that Christ-like character in you. And I guarantee you, we're not going to get there today, but it's going to tell us that it's about suffering like Christ suffered. Because that's the only way to have life. It's the only way to get there. God's Holy Spirit tells us that He wants us to have peace. Peace with God. And peace with other people. Now, I'm about to come to the third lesson. I want you to pay real close attention to this third one. You've got to recognize who does this. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Now, you've got to recognize this fact. You can't give yourself the Holy Spirit. You can't give yourself the Holy Spirit. Human conversion is not about getting the things of God. It's not about coming to being persuaded that the things of God are right and true. It's not even about accepting the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. That's important, but that's not spiritual life. That's not really what it takes to convert you. You don't get the uh, Holy Spirit of God by accepting that Christ died on the cross. A lot of people accepted he died on the cross, but they weren't saved. You can even say, well, he rose from the dead, and you make up some lie about it. That's what the leaders did, the Jewish leaders did. They rejected the evidence of the resurrection. They made up some lie about Christ. It's not about what I do. It's not about human conversion. It is the work of God. It is the work of God. You can't give yourself the Holy Spirit any more than you can cause a tornado. You don't have the ability. It's just like giving yourself life. I decided to give myself life, to bring myself into existence, to be born on January 1st, 1956. I made those decisions. It doesn't work that way. The spiritual life doesn't come about because I decided I'm going to follow Christ. It is the work of God. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He's none of His, says in the King James. He's none of His. It's something God has to give you. It's not something you can gin up. You know, there are workshops that you can go to to learn how to get the Holy Spirit, how to speak in tongues, how to get holy laughter, which I don't know how in the world they got from holy laughter to that being a sign of the Spirit of God. But you can go to workshops and learn how to fake it, how to do it. That's, yeah, you can fake it, but you can't get the real thing. God will give His Spirit to those who meet the conditions. Putting your trust in God, putting your faith that what Christ did on the cross is sufficient for you, that God provides the salvation, and you cry out to Him, and God will do it. But you've got to recognize it's not you doing it, it's Him doing it. God did not give you the Spirit because, you know, you were doing pretty well. God gave you the Spirit because you couldn't handle this thing. You needed a Savior. You can't get saved by yourself. You can't live the Christian life by yourself. You don't only need other Christians, other people. You need somebody to tell you the gospel. You need somebody to teach you the Word of God. You need somebody to encourage you in the things of God. But listen, none of that will avail unless God has saved you. 
And the only thing that we know that happens when God, not the only thing, man, there are tons of things. There's 30, 40 things that happen the moment you put your trust in Christ. But every one of them is the work of God. I'm not going to have time to get down to how you've, ado- you've been adopted into God's family. You've been adopted not just into God's family, but you've been adopted with full sonship rights. The heir of Christ. That's coming next week. It takes four weeks to get through Romans 8. We'll do that. Maybe not five, but we'll take four. But listen, all that happens because God does it. That's why it's faith. It's faith that God does the work. It's faith that God gives you the Holy Spirit. Listen, when the spiritual life comes, when the Holy Spirit comes within, our bodies may be dying, but we're living We're living a right life. He has imputed to us Christ's righteousness by faith and is leading us into right living. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. God will lead us into right living and he will lead us and do for us what he did for Christ. It's about resurrection. Look back at verse 11. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, If you have the Spirit of God, if He's living within you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. You see, that's what Easter's about. Not eggs and bunnies and chocolate. Praise God for chocolate. That's not what it's about. It's hope. Certain hope. That since God has raised Jesus from the dead and God has placed the Spirit of Christ in me, I can do nothing other than rise from the dead. It's impossible for me not to rise from the dead because the Spirit of God is living in me. And listen, if the Spirit of God is living in you, you will rise from the dead. It doesn't matter about your mortal body. That's got to go anyway. Can't get rid of the, can't get the new body until you get rid of the old body. Either you've got to die or it's got to be transformed. You're not going into the presence of the Lord in this kind of a body. You're either going to be raised in a supernatural body, a body like Christ, or it's going to be transformed before you get to Christ. But you're going to have that transformation take place. You're going to rise from the dead and bodily enter into the very presence of God and enjoy the kingdom of God forever and ever. You can't help it if the Spirit of God is living within you. Because the Spirit of God is going to give life to these mortal bodies. It's about resurrection from the dead. Do you have what it takes to live the spiritual life? You've got to reject fleshly living. It'll trip you up. It'll destroy life. You've got to refocus and say, I want what the Spirit of God is leading me to. I want what God wants. And you've got to recognize, I can't do this. If I'm going to live this way, I've got to live in dependence upon God and Him alone because only God can do that in my life and in yours. Let's walk in the Spirit of God. Let's be led by the Spirit of God that we might have the life of God and that eternal resurrection of God. Let's bow together in prayer. You can't save yourself. You can't live the Christian life. God has to save you. And God has to walk that life for you. He has to lead you by His Spirit. Have you put your trust in Him? Have you called upon God to save you? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not something you do. It's something He does and he alone have you come to the place in your life where by faith you said I need you to save me God please save me for Jesus sake you'll cry out to him God will do what he says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved God will do it he'll do what only God can do are you a child of God Do you have the Spirit of God living within you? Can you tell the difference in your life before 
you trusted Christ and afterwards? If you can, you can recognize that's because the Spirit of God is living. Things bother you now that didn't bother you before. The sin you used to enjoy is miserable to you. You just can't be happy living a life of sin. But you're also a little frustrated because you keep getting tripped up. Listen, it's by faith. It's walking by faith. It's following step by step what the Spirit of God is leading you to do. Don't try to run ahead. Walk by faith as we learn to live this Christian life. Father, we come into your presence today to thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we freely confess we were unable to save ourselves. Lord, we've come to recognize as we've been studying through Romans that not only are we unable to save ourselves, we're absolutely unable in ourselves, in our strength, in our abilities, to live in a way that's right and holy. Sin is just too strong. But Father, we know the joy of walking in your Spirit. We know those moments, we've seen them, where you've lived out your life in us and it's been such a thrill, such a joy. Everything has come together. Lord, we've had victory over sin because sin never defeats you. So, Father, we ask that you'll teach us how to walk in your spirit. Lord, not only that our lives might be joyful and righteous and peace, but, Father, that you might get what you want, what you've laid hold on us for, so that we might indeed become like your Son, Jesus Christ. We might live out what you've said is true of us, that we are children of God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.